In this lecture, we will discuss atrial flutter, including its mechanism, EKG features, and how it is classified. Atrial flutter is a form of re-entrant atrial tachycardia characterized by rapid regular undulation on the EKG. It is a type of supraventricular tachycardia, meaning it's originating above the ventricles, and it's caused by a re-entry circuit within the right atrium. Sometimes the circulating impulses may cross over into the left atrium. Okay, so if you look here, we can see our circulating. Notice here we have a our initiating point, this in green, and notice how this is going around in a circle, okay? And it just continues to circulate within this right atrium. Sometimes it may cross over into the left atrium and also create a uh, circuit as well over there. Now, one interesting point is that the length of the circuit tends to correspond to the size of the right atrium. And this results in a fairly predictable rate of about 300 beats per minute in adults. Okay, so in atrial flutter, we have a continuous circular course that the impulse takes, and it sets up a regular rapid flutter waves, or F waves, with no isoelectric baseline. You may often hear these referred to as a sawtooth pattern. The P waves are usually referred to as those flutter waves, or F waves, and that's an F with a capital F, and this is because they are not much like the P waves. In fact, the duration and sometimes even the amplitude of these flutter waves is often significantly greater than that of normal P waves. So if you look here, we can see our flutter waves, okay? So our flutter waves are these here, all right? So flutter, and we're using that capital F to denote them, okay? So these are all our flutter waves throughout, okay? And you'll notice that one of the main things, what differentiates them and why we call them that, is that they're different from actual P waves, okay? Their duration in and their amplitude may be greater. So meaning duration, meaning their width, okay, as well as their amplitude are tend to be greater than normal P waves, okay? Now, just so you're aware, when we're what we're looking at here is a normal EKG or rhythm strip. And as we go down here, this in red, okay, so this portion here is just highlighting those flutter waves. And notice that undulating, this is what we call an undulating pattern, okay, we're not forming any baseline, right, no flat areas. So we have this undulating pattern that continues right through. And if you were to take all those um, flutter waves or all the atrial activity out, you would see something like this, okay, down here. Okay, so just so you're aware. So what we're saying is you could just pretty much continue that through and you'd get that same pattern. Okay, so those are flutter or F waves. Now, unlike intraatrial reentral tachycardia and other forms of paroxysmal atrial tachycardia that have an anatomically small reentry pathway, the atrial flutter impulses travel in a longer and larger, generally circular course within the atria along that larger and continuous F waves. Okay, so what you can do to help remember atrial flutter is that the pathways are longer and larger. Okay, and that way the continuous flutter waves or those F waves are also tend to be longer and larger, okay? So what we're saying is we have this circuit up here in the atria that's going around and it tends to be larger than most other reentrant circuits, okay? And so one way to remember that these F waves are also bigger than normal P waves is that the circuit is also big. So you can remember those like that. Now, these flutter waves can sometimes be difficult to identify on the EKG. Oftentimes the best leads to look for them are in leads AVF, okay? and lead V1. Carotid sinus massage or other vagal maneuvers can sometimes be helpful in transiently unmasking these flutter waves because they increase the degree of AV block and they slow the ventricular rate, okay? You really want to see these flutter waves throughout the EKG tracing to truly make the diagnosis of atrial flutter. And this is because at times, coarse atrial fibrillation may look a lot like atrial flutter, okay? And we'll talk about atrial fibrillation in upcoming lectures. You may hear such a rhythm referred to as a flutter fibrillation, okay? And this behaves more like atrial fibrillation clinically, okay? So just remember to look for the flutter waves throughout the EKG tracing before you make the diagnosis of atrial flutter, okay? And what we're saying with that carotid massage is if you use it, okay, you can sometimes get a greater delay or block here at the AV node so that you can see uh, these flutter waves, okay? And it will space out these even more, these uh, ventricular impulses, okay? Now, 
what we have here is a rapid regular a rapid regular rapid undulating flutter waves that we've said the atrial rate tends to be close to 300 beats per minute in adults and it's often between 250 and 350 okay so if you look here our atrial rate we'll look at these flutter waves let's just erase some of this here so you can see it okay and we said these flutter waves are these right here so if we were to look at that you can pretty much take this down here okay to this line all right so there's about five or six thick or thick small boxes between there so you can imagine 300 over one okay a rate of about 300 beats per minute right in that range that we said it would be 250 to 350 okay now we often see some degree of av block present and if the av block is regular such as two to one three to one or four to one and so on the ventricular or qrs rate will be the sum fraction of these th of 300 okay so you have some fraction of 300 if you have those uh, constant or those regular blocks in other words if you have a two to one block which is the most most common well and we have an atrial rate of 300 then that would suggest a ventricular rate of 150 beats per minute if there was a three to one av block with a atrial rate of 300 beats per minute then the ventricular rate would be 100 beats per minute if there was a four to one av block with an atrial rate of 300 then the ventricular rate would be 75 beats per minute okay so what we see here is we have one flutter wave okay okay a qrs and then we start over one two qrs okay one two qrs okay so we call this a two to one block all right and if we were to look at our atrial rate as we saw it was 300 okay so 300 and it's a two to one that means our ventricular rate would be 150 and we can find that here notice our qrs falls on this line and the next qrs is on this the r wave so one two okay so two thick lines in between so 300 over two is 150 and that's what we have as our ventricular rate so we call that a two to one you have two flutter waves for one qrs complex okay so let's just so you're just aware of this okay this is what we mean by these things and this is two to one is the most common so again you have one flutter wave two flutter waves a qrs one flutter wave two flutter waves qrs okay two to one block with an atrial rate of 300 and then a ventricular rate of 150 okay and we said you can also get something of three to one okay so if we had a three to one that would mean the atrial rate would be 300 okay and then we'd have a, vent or a ventricular rate of 100 beats per minute if it was a four to one we would have an atrial rate of 300 okay and then that ventricular rate would be 75. hopefully that makes sense there okay now once in a while you can see atrial flutter with a one-to-one -one av conduction meaning that for one atrial or flutter wave we have one qrs complex and this is often due to sympathetic stimulation or the presence of an accessory pathway especially if av nodal blocking agents are given to a patient with wpw syndrome it's important to be aware of this form of one-to-one -one conduction because it's commonly associated with severe hemodynamic instability in progression to ventricular fibrillation now if we don't see regular f to f intervals and instead see irregular f to f intervals we would call it atrial flutter with a variable ventricular response okay so again what we mean here in this case we see that we have regular intervals okay between all of our complexes meaning from one f wave to the next f wave these are all the same these intervals are the same throughout okay however if we had uh, a case where we didn't have that okay so we had these f waves okay and again note that the qrs complexes are the same throughout so if one r wave to the next R wave, all of these intervals are the same. But if instead we had a QRS complex that maybe occurred here, okay, and then instead of occurring at the next point, occurred maybe at this one, all right, and then the next one occurred here, and the next one maybe here, and you just had this irregular pattern, we would call that atrial flutter with a variable ventricular response, okay? Variable ventricular response because remember, these QRS complex represent ventricular depolarization. Okay. Now, this may mimic atrial fibrillation with irregular ventricular response, but if you look closer, you may see an alternating pattern of 2 to 1, 3 to 1, and 4 to 1 conduction ratios. Okay. On the other hand, with atrial fibrillation, everything would be completely irregular with no patterns within the 
R to R intervals. Okay, so that's a little more advanced, but um, I think when you start looking at atrial fibrillation, you come back and read this, it'll start to make more sense. Okay, so there's something you should realize. We keep saying AV block, but this is more of a misnomer in the context of atrial flutter. That is, AV block and atrial flutter is more of a physiologic response to the rapid atrial rates and implies a normally functioning AV node rather than a pathologic AV block. Okay, so what we're saying is that because we have such fast rates going on here up in the atria and it is bombarding this AV node, okay, sometimes you get these blocks because the AV node can only take so much and it can only send an impulse through at so often, okay, because other times when the impulse hits that AV node, it will be refractory and nothing can get through, okay, so that's what we mean about this AV block. It's not an actual problem at the AV node here, but more of a physiologic response to this rapid rate. Now, in terms of intraventricular conduction, we should see narrow normal QRS complexes. Unless there's some pre-existing intraventricular conduction delay, accessory pathway, or rate-related aberrant conduction. Another thing to note is that if you come across a rapid, regular supraventricular tachycardia at exactly 150 beats per minute, you should still strongly suggest uh, or expect and look for atrial flutter, even if you can't observe flutter waves, okay? So how would we differentiate between atrial flutter from paroxysmal atrial tachycardia? Well, it's not based on the atrial rate because we're already saying that there's some overlap. Instead, atrial flutter has the characteristic continuous undulating flutter waves and lacks an isoelectric baseline, whereas paroxysmal atrial tachycardia would have those discrete P waves that we can make out, okay? So again, something a little more advanced and there's a lot here, but I really want you to hear this first. I know it's a lot, but as you come back and review it, it'll, it'll start to come together. All right, so we're almost done. We're going to finish by looking at classifications of atrial flutter. Again, this is more advanced, but it can be clinically useful. Okay, so how is atrial flutter classified? Well, there are two classifications that you should be aware of. The first is the typical form, which is also referred to as the common type or type one. And then we have the atypical form, which is also referred to as the uncommon type or type two. Now, these classifications are based on two things. There's the anatomical location, and the second is the direction of the reentry circuit. So let's look at the typical form first. Okay, so this is the typical form. If you look at our chart, this is where we're at looking at the classifications, okay, based on anatomical location and the direction that we'll see of this reentry circuit. So this typical or type one uh, form is the one we're going to look at. Okay, so the typical atrial flutter involves the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid isthmus in the reentry circuit. The atrial rate is often between 250 and 350 beats per minute, as we would expect normally. Now, this typical form can then be subdivided depending on the direction of the reentry circuit. If the direction of the reentry circuit is counterclockwise, which is actually the most common form of atrial flutter, then we would see retrograde atrial conduction. And if there is retrograde atrial conduction, then we will see inverted flutter waves in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF, and positive flutter waves in lead V1, which may resemble upright P waves, okay? So let's take a look at this. Uh, let's erase some of this so we can see what's going on here, okay? So now we're talking about this typical form, okay? And we're looking at this counterclockwise reentry circuit. And that's what you actually see here, the most common one. So starting here near the IVC inferior vena cava and our tricuspid valves here. So imagine it right in this area and we're having a reentry circuit that's going counterclockwise, okay? So in this direction, coming about and you have this circuit developing, okay? And what we're saying is if it's starting here, let's just erase again some of this, it's starting at that green point and heading in that counterclockwise direction, it will be going away from our inferior lead. So where are the inferior leads, okay? So if we look at our inferior leads, here's lead two, here's lead three, here's lead AVF. So if they're going away from that, we will see inverted uh, P waves, okay? So going away, although it's coming again back uh, to the front of the heart and going in the horizontal plane, it'll be heading towards V1. And that's why we can see upright P waves or F waves um, in those leads, okay? So that's the typical counterclockwise form. Now, if the direction of the reentry circuit is clockwise, so going in the opposite direction, which is uncommon, we have anterograde atrial conduction and pretty much the opposite pattern on the EKG. We will see positive flutter waves in the inferior leads, 2, 3, and AVF, and broad inverted flutter waves uh, in a lead V1, okay? So now we're pretty much saying that this circuit is going in the opposite direction. So again, 
we're starting from here, but now we're going in this way, okay? So imagine that we're going in this direction, and what we're saying here is that we'll see these positive flutter waves as they come down anterogradely, so they're coming down towards these leads, okay? And because they're coming down anterogradely towards the inferior leads, we will see those upright positive flutter waves in those leads, okay? But now it's going away, it's going backwards, away from uh, V1, and that's why we see these broad inverted flutter waves, okay? So again, this is a little more advanced stuff, but I think you can start to get it and see what's going on. Now we have the atypical form of atrial flutter, that second form down here, okay? And this form occurs when the criteria for the typical form are not met. The main thing here to know is that has been associated with higher atrial rates, often between 350 and 450 beats per minute, rhythm instability, and it appears to be less responsive to treatment with ablation. All right, so let's briefly run through our chart to make sure we didn't miss anything here. So again, the main thing I want you to get here um, is that atrial flutter is a rapid regular circulating impulse in the right atrium. Sometimes we said it can involve the left atrium. Remember the circuit length is proportional to the right atrial size and that's why we commonly see the rate around 300 beats per minute. Okay, That circuit tends to be similar in length. There's no isoelectric baseline. Right, We saw that it's continuously undulating up and down and we have no baseline. We talked about the classifications. Okay, And then remember the regularity, it's usually regular, but it could be variable if we have that uh, variable response. We talked about the atrial rate, commonly between 250 and 350, a little faster in the atypical form, but I would just remember this for now. The ventricular rate tends to be between 125 and 175, okay? In terms of the P waves, which we in this case call the flutter waves, we have that sawtooth appearing undulating regular flutter waves, okay? And they're identical throughout. Notice how they're just continuing through undulating back and forth, okay? And you can think of it as that sawtooth appearance, okay? So if you hear on an exam, sawtooth appearance is probably what they're going for. Remember, these are different from regular P waves, and that's why we call them flutter waves or F waves because their duration and amplitude, which tend to go uh, with this longer reentry circuit, tend to be greater, okay? Remember to look at AVF in lead V1, okay? And you can turn the EKG upside down that can sometimes help you uh, by identifying these flutter waves. So oftentimes the most common is this two to one conduction, right? Where we had the 300 to 150 beats per minute, as we saw here, one, two, and then a QRS complex. Okay, so two flutter waves for one QRS, all right? Then we talked about this quote unquote AV block, not really an AV block, but because the AV nodes being bombarded so much, we can get this, okay? And we said it's often regular. If we have a one-to-one -one condu conduction, think of an accessory pathway, all right? When we talk about accessory pathways, this will make more sense because why it's important is these patients can be unstable and then uh, go out and turn this uh, rhythm into V-fib, which can be lethal, all right? So if you have irregular F-to-F intervals, think of atrial flutter with variable ventricular response, okay? So again, the PR interval really varies, okay? Not really something you should be too concerned of at this point. The QRS interval, again, tends to be normal. You notice these are all the same. The only difference is if you have some pre-existing intraventricular conduction delay, accessory pathway, or some rate-related aberrant conduction. There's no grouping and then uh, no dropped beats that you should be aware of. Well, I know this was a long lecture, but we just finished and we discussed the mechanism of atrial flutter, the EKG features, and then some classifications. I hope you learned something.